Amen. So we're going to be opening up our Bibles today to Mark chapter 7, last sermon on Mark chapter 7. And um, this chapter is really all related. Now, the sermon today is going to be on Jesus healing two Gentiles. All right. But if you remember, we opened up the chapter with Jesus. Well, we started in chapter six, really, with Jesus ministering in Genesaret, in the region of Genesaret. And I mean, so many people were getting healed. People were just bringing people out. And even if they touched him, they got healed. And this was a totally Jewish thing going on. It was in the Jewish community, Jewish area. And that's how we conclude chapter six. And then in chapter seven, same area, wherever they are, it's a Jewish area, and the scribes and Pharisees show up and criticize by way of testing through asking questions regarding uh, the rules and traditions of men. Not even Jewish law, but the rules of tradition of, and traditions of men. And Jesus rebukes them. So my first sermon on chapter 7 was Jesus confronting and rebuking the Pharisees. And then the next sermon was on strictly on the condition of a man's heart. Focusing primarily on the Pharisees, but expanding that to people in general on the state of our heart and how, you know, we can't help but manifest outwardly, whether in word or deed, the condition of our hearts. All right. And so that now we are entering into the final part and I combined it into one sermon. I could have preached two, but I just thought I keep forgetting to turn my volume off here. There we go. Um, now Jesus leaves the Jewish area and goes, and they go quite a distance to get there, to a Gentile area, a pagan area. And he heals somebody. Then they walk another 40 or 50 miles. Uh, this is what it is. I measured it out with my little pen and paper on a map that had, what do you call that thing? It shows you the miles. A key, a key, scale, yeah. And uh, they end up way down southwest, uh, no, southeast, on the southeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee in the Decapolis. And if you remember, in the Decapolis was where we preached on, I preached a sermon on earlier where Jesus goes and heals a demoniac who had 6,000 demons. And he, and he returns to this place, and now his fame is wide and far. And people, are, they know Jesus is here, and there's a deaf and dumb guy, and Jesus heals him. And just to summarize my sermon, you can leave after this if you want. You don't want to hang out for another 45, 50 minutes. But basically what he's showing us is the contrast between hearts. And that faith, love, is not, he's not there just so the Jews would get this, but it's for everyone. And, and so two things are happening in this chapter that we have to realize it's kind of pivoting points. The first is that in rebuking the Pharisees, Jesus, this was his first visible, unveiled attack of the Pharisees and what they do. All right, so that, that's one mark that's in this chapter. The next one is Jesus turning to the Gentiles. And even though he came for the Jew first, and we're going to get into the specifics of it, he also does not deny Gentiles who would receive from him. Even though we know, because we know our Bibles, that the Gentile church isn't truly birthed until Acts chapter 2, that doesn't preclude God from making exceptions to the general rule and healing anyone who has a heart for him. And then we're going to see next week in chapter 8, we preached in chapter, I forget what chapter, I think it was five, where Jesus heals, or maybe it was six, the 5,000, and it was all Jewish. And now he's, he's in a Gentile land, and we're going to see he now does the exact same thing. He feeds a multitude of Gentiles, and it has its appropriate accompanying symbology in the amount that's left over, but I don't want to get into that. That's next week. Amen. Amen. So we open up our Bibles to Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. Father God, I come before you, Lord, and I ask that you would just, through me, Lord, that your truth would be spoken, Lord God, that, um, that through the um, opening up of your word, Lord, to us, the illumination of the truths of your word in our 
minds and our spirits, Lord God, that we might be drawn closer to you, Lord, and that through this um, drawing close, Lord God, that we might um, bring glory to you, Lord God, not just in saying hallelujah, praise you, how awesome it is to hear these truths, but also in, that we be changed in how we affect other people and how we touch other people's lives, Lord God, as, as Jesus is so aptly portraying to us in ministering to all these people, may we not hold on to what we've been given, the gift we've been given, and, um, and hold it too closely that we don't pour it out to others, Lord. Glory to you, Father, Son, and Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. Mark chapter 7, verse 24. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs, to the dogs. Jesus needed a little lesson in compassion, didn't he? No, we're going to see. We're going we're to see the truth of what he's saying here. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned to the region of Tyre, from the region of Tyre, and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his finger into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, let me, let me say this right, Ephatha, 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 that is, be open, Ephatha. And his ears were opened, his, tongues was, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Hallelujah. God is good, isn't he? He does not deny the person who comes to him asking for a fish, does he? He doesn't say, nah, here's a stone instead. Right? Right? He doesn't care who you are. He doesn't care if you're a Jew or a Gentile. He doesn't care if you're rich or poor. He doesn't care what side of the tracks you live on. He doesn't care about your past. He cares about your heart, where you are now, your spirit, your mind. And he will not deny anyone who comes to him in the right way, I guess I should say, in the right state, there's a better word. So in Mark 7, 24... And from there he arose, oh, first off, I want to welcome everyone on Facebook. Hi, and, and I'm glad you're here. Please be here if you're going to be here. Have your Bible. Don't get up five times because you're home. I know the temptation could be real and there. But try to set this time aside to be at church, amen? And to study along, to read along, and to grow with us. In the name of Jesus. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know Yet he could not be hidden. So having just finished the first offensive against the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus went away to Tyre and Sidon. Now, why would he do that? It wasn't like it was real close. You've got to realize the, reason, the region of Genesaret, there was a town called Genesaret. And it was on the eastern shore, uh, the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, just south of Capernaum. But it was a region of Genesaret. Right? It would be kind of like having a, um, a county called Oneida and then a town called Oneida. All right? But they're in the region. So they're walking all around and they're walking. It's a good 30 miles to get to the borderlands of Tyre and Sidon. All right? They're regions northeast of Israel on the Mediterranean Sea. 
in what is now called the area of Lebanon, then called Phoenicia. So the reason why she's called a Syrophoenician woman is because she's from the area of Syria that is ruled by Greek culture, hence the name Phoenicia. Okay? So this woman's not a Jew. She's born a Syrian, and she's raised in Grecian culture. All right? Jesus and his disciples removed themselves from Israel in the presence of the Jewish leaders, who no doubt were very offended and angry at this point in time. Right? He just ripped into them and basically explained to the crowds, with them still present, how bad their hearts are. I mean, just summarizing. How far away their hearts were from receiving truth and life, that they were in fact false teachers. So at this point, you're going to see a real shift in the Pharisees and scribes and the plots to um, have Jesus arrested and killed even start rising up more. All right. They also moved into an area that most Jews would have considered unclean. The region in which these cities were located had a long history of paganism and opposition to the Jews. These were not Jewish regions. They were pagan. They worshipped many gods, all the Greek gods. Okay? And this is the culture this woman was raised in. Now, on the one hand, it's good because, and we see this in the book of Acts when Paul ministers because... He uses that as his, um, as his segue to preach about Christ, saying, I know of another God. Right? He's called the, because they had a, a, a memorial where he preached these people called the Memorial to the Unknown God. And he said, guess what? I know that God. Right? So they were open to hearing about God, and in this case, the true God. So that was good. But... <clears throat> The main thing here is that, remember, it's, this is the second or third time in just a chapter where they're trying to find somewhere to rest. They haven't had that yet. Every, and they're not going to get that now. Because everywhere they go, there are people to be ministered to. And, and I guess if I had to apply that to you at all and to me, it's that sometimes you have to sacrifice. You know, you may be getting ready to sit down and put on the TV and watch your favorite show and then somebody calls on the phone and they're hurting. What do you do? Do you, do you not answer? Do you hit deny or whatever it's called? Or do you pick up the phone? You know, and, and we are called as believers many, many times to put down what we want for the sake of others. It's just the way it is. The life of a Christian is self-sacrificial. Now, we don't want to be drawn to a place where like it kills us and it causes undue stress in our lives and fights and you know we need to know you know like Kenny Rogers used to sing you got to know when to hold them and when to fold them you know you need to know when it's time to rest but realize we're called to leave live lives of self-sacrifice agape lives that's the definition of love applied to the Christian is one of self-sacrifice selflessness so they were trying to get away and get some rest. And so they're near this area where it's not Jewish. So he knows the Pharisees and scribes aren't going to show up in Tyre and Sidon. So off they go. And as we can see, they didn't get any rest. The people knew that he was there. You know, his fame is spreading far and wide to pagan and Jewish cultures alike. Mark seven twenty five. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. And that breaks my heart. And, and I, when I think, you know, whenever I'm preparing sermons, I try to run the movie in my mind, you know, and, and, and really in slow motion and, and really get, like if I was the director or producer of a movie, how I would manifest that scene on the screen and that look of desperation on this woman's face would be severe. Her daughter is possessed by a demon. She's not just afflicted. She's not just oppressed, which is what the scripture here reads, but I read the other accounts as well. She was fully possessed by a demon. Okay. And I'm sure she's gone to all the gods and goddesses to try to get healing, the priests and priestesses, and no resolution. And she's desperate. And she hears about this man, Jesus, who's healing people and delivering people. So when she heard that he was around, she ran to him and she fell down at 
his feet. Now, can you picture a scribe or Pharisee after hearing the sermon on, on, on Mark 7, 1 through 13? Can you imagine a scribe or Pharisee even thinking of doing something like that? I want you to see the contrast between the hearts of the scribes and Pharisees. The hearts of the Jews, just one sentence, back, one verse back in chapter 6, who are getting healed by multitudes. And then the heart of this woman. And the heart, well, the heart of this woman is really what's, what stands out. Jesus' renown had spread all throughout the areas in and surrounding Israel. Whether a Jewish area or a Gentile no longer mattered. mattered. Everyone had heard about this man claiming to be the Messiah, performing so many miracles, miraculous signs of healing, deliverance, multiplication of food. You name it, there was nothing Jesus couldn't do, right? If you're a person in, in desperate straits looking for a miracle, that's your hope, isn't it? There's nothing he can't do. You see, and that's the kind of heart one needs when approaching the Lord Christ, if you will, have that done for you. Mark 7, 26, and I coupled this with the parallel scripture in um, Matthew 15, 22. I'm going to read them together. Now, the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 15, 22, same account, it adds, she was crying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. So she's Syrophoenician. I already explained that to you. She's a resident of the air of the uh, region called Phoenicia. Okay, way northeast, uh, northwest above the Sea of Galilee. On the coast. All right, it's, it's roughly 40 miles from that area to the Sea of Galilee. Grecian culture, conquered by uh, Alexander the Great years before, many years before. And what they would do is when they would, when they would conquer, they would plant people from their own culture, from their own region into that area to help transition that culture that they're taking over from what they used to believe to what the Grecians now believe. So by now, it's a Grecian culture, okay? She was a Syrophoenician. She, she cried out, oh Lord, son of David. Both terms are used by Jews to describe the coming Messiah. Okay? Now, she's not a Jew. And I don't even know that she even necessarily knew the implication of what she was saying in a Jewish understanding. But I know what she felt in her heart at this point. That this guy may just be that God returned that the Jews always talk about. The Messiah. The Christ. And she knew the jargon. A term used for the Messiah only in the three synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels are the gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And basically what that means is that they, they have similarities. They record a lot of the same events. Whereas John is a different gospel. It records different events and it speaks to us in different ways than the other three. The Gentile woman comes with two very necessary things if we would approach the Savior for what he has to offer. Two qualities of character that no man can receive eternal life without. No woman. Humility and faith. Humility and faith. Humble enough, desperate enough to fall down at his feet and beg, saying, you can do what I cannot. You are someone, you are something I am not. And I believe this. Faith, right? Again, you would not see the scribes and Pharisees doing this. Although we do see later, one scribe and Pharisee indeed does do that. I mean, he doesn't do, we don't see it written in the Bible, but Nicodemus eventually becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. He was a Pharisee. There were, there were Christians among the Pharisees. But for the most part, these scribes and Pharisees, they came to Jesus in pride and condescension, testing him. 
And in great contrast to that, she comes to Jesus pleading, have mercy on me, O son of David, Lord. Do not give me what I deserve. What does she deserve? Now I'm speaking as a Jew in Jewish culture regarding a pagan Gentile. She deserves to be shunned. She deserved not to have the time of day other than, you know, if I have interactions with them, that's it. I don't go beyond what's the necessary and then I stay away from them because they're pagan worshipers. They worship idols. By Jewish law and tradition, Gentiles are unclean. They are to be avoided. This is of the traditions of men. All right? This speaks to the traditions of men and laws of men. This doesn't speak of the law of Moses. This is exactly what Jesus had issue with with the Pharisees and the scribes in, the, in Mark 7, 1 through 13. In reality, though, Per the law of Moses, well, per the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, per the book of Genesis, the Jews are supposed to be a light to the world, the light to the Gentiles. In Genesis 18, 17, and 18, it says this. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham surely shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And then the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 42 verse 6 had this to say, God speaking, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. Israel was always intended to be a light to the Gentiles. They were never supposed to shun the Gentiles. They were never supposed to run away from the Gentiles because of their uncleanliness. Yes, according to the Mosaic law, they are unclean. But they're called to, to shine light on them. And to do that, you're going to have to associate with them. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We're not called to become monks, monks. Monks on a hill. In a monastery, we're called to be among the people. For how else will they hear unless someone preaches? Right? Jesus knows this. But this Gentile woman does not. She assumes he's looking at her as an unclean pagan. All she knows of the Jews is their behaviors towards her, her past experience, and what she's heard and what she's observed and what she's noted, that she was considered unclean. She was not someone, a Jew, nonetheless a rabbi, would want to hang around um, for any extended amount of time. You know, when I think about it, I'm, I'm saying this to you, it's not in my notes, I'm saying this to you and I'm picturing in my mind the heroin addict or the prostitute or the crack addict. You know, why would they want to, you know, they don't really want to hang out with me, you know. Or what about the adulterer? What about the Christian who's fallen? Who, who has that sense of shame that they have to leave and they can't come back? When all we want to do, I hope, is restore them. Whether, whether saved and they've backslid, we want to restore them. And if they're lost, we want to restore them to the Father for the first time in their lives. You can't do that if you're avoiding them, can you? Don't avoid those society says are less than you are because guess what? They're not. You're both just as worthy of hell. So in this woman's mind, Jesus has no business hearing her plea. So she begs him for compassion. She has faith, believing him to be the Messiah of Israel and able, that's probably the most important part, able, to do all she has heard he has done. She says in the ESV that her child is severely oppressed by a demon. The ESV is being too kind. I generally love the ESV. It's what we use in this church. But every once in a while, I run across something. When I compare it to the other versions, I go, hmm. When I look up the Greek, I go, not the best translation in my mind anyway. 
Um, as the King James put it, she was grievously vexed by a demon. And looking up the words grievously and vexed, I determined it means extremely possessed. And I must draw, back, draw us back to the Pharisees and the scribes. But first, even further back to the crowds Jesus was ministering to, which drew the scribes and Pharisees at the end of Mark 6. Mark 6, 56, last verse of chapter 6. Wherever he, Jesus, came in villages, cities, or countryside, this is in the region of Gennesaret that I talked about earlier, they laid the sick in the marketplace and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. Man, hallelujah, unimaginable, inconceivable. Jesus is in Israel ministering to a Jewish crowd, mass miracles. No mention of levels of faith, but faith implied nonetheless. And divine virtue, Jesus' divine virtue, is poured out and it never fails. Never. And the results are immediate. They're not slow. They're not like, you know, keep believing. So while heart is not specifically mentioned in that verse in 656, when Jesus is doing mass miracles in the Genesaret region, the hearts of the people are such that Jesus could heal many. Did they have faith the size of a boulder? Probably some. What about faith the size of a mustard seed? Probably many. And as we'll see, this woman's heart was such that Jesus would not deny her, our Syrophoenician woman, and not deny her little daughter who's not even there. She's at home, in bed, possessed, vexed, grievously. And her Gentile background would not be a wall preventing Jesus from touching her. Slide six, please. Matthew 15, 23 to 25. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him saying, send her away for she is crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. As we see here, the gospel of Matthew gives us more information on the exact same instance of what's going on here. Jesus knew the gospel would go out to the entire world. That the title spiritual Israel would encompass not just the people within natural, national borders. He also knew that the Gentiles inclusion into spiritual Israel through the gospel of grace would not begin in earnest until after he had ascended back to the Father. But, however, the Son of God is under no obligation not to minister to those of faith, be they Jewish or Gentile, when a heart ready for grace is encountered. Amen? Praise God. He came to seek and save the lost. He didn't say the Jewish lost. He didn't say the Italian lost, the lost. And when Jesus says to her next, what he says to her next seems to be in the order of a test for her, as well as a witness to the disciples. He wants to test her, but he wants the disciples to see. He wants, it's a lesson for them. The apostles of what bold faith looks like and what it can accomplish. In Mark 7, 27 and 28, he says to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Wow. Christ's first responsibility was indeed to preach the gospel to the Jews, the children of Israel. That bread was for them first. So the, the, the children's bread, the loaves, represent the gospel. All right, and he came to the Jew first. We know this. 
That bread was for them first, but, and this is illustrated clearly by the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 34, we previously preached on, went over, when over 5,000 Jews were fed outside of Nazareth. And we saw the amount of um, uh, bread and fish that were left over were 12 and how that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. There's enough, uh, there's enough bread for every single Jew. And we're going to see in Mark 8, there's enough bread for every single Gentile as well. Or enough crumbs, I should say. But it becomes bread. So dogs. This was one of my aha moments for this week. You know, because you read it and you go, well, that's pretty insulting. Right? And yet, she answers, yes, Lord. She doesn't argue with him. She knows what the Jews think of the pagans. But there's something here that you're missing unless you look up the Greek. Now, I tell you this. If this happened today, Jesus would be canceled. Right? CNN, cancel him. And that would not be because Jesus was blatantly insulting this woman whom he did not, who he deemed unclean. It would be because the listener does not fully understand either the culture of, or what Jesus is saying to her, nor her response back. So did he really insult her? Well, in this group of verses, the word for dog is the word kuan. That's the Greek word. And it's used in Matthew 7, 6, 727, 728. This is not the word used here. Oh wait, let me let me backtrack. The Greek word for dog is the word kuon. And that's the word used when Jesus uh, uh, uses the word dogs in Matthew 7, 6. All right? It's not the word used here. So taking a look at those verses, Matthew 7, verses 5 through 6, say this. You hypocrite, t first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Next verse. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. This is referring to the people who you try to share the love of Christ with maybe once, maybe five times, and they are just nasty. They hate you. If they could, they'd attack you. And Jesus rightly calls them pigs and dogs. Clearly an insult. Okay? But here in this verse, with this woman speaking of the crumbs falling and the dogs coming and eating the crumbs... He doesn't use the word kuang. He uses instead the Greek word kunarian, which is not simply a dog, but a puppy. It's a puppy. Now, when I think of that, and I think of the word puppy, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of where they are, uh, pagans, Gentiles, us, before Christ, unless you were born Jewish. We, we were kind of puppies. We knew about gods and, you know, we knew about things spiritual, but we didn't really know about the God of Israel, right? Whereas the Jews had centuries of the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one true God. To the Greeks, he was an unknown God. Yet they had a certain understanding that there was an unknown God. They were puppies. So Robertson's Word Pictures, it's a, um, a commentary book that, that speaks in pictures of what is being said to give you a better understanding of, of what they're exactly saying. And it draws a picture in, in Jesus' words to her of, um, with the house pet, like, like, like a family that just got a puppy and the puppy's running around the table. Is that puppy hated? Puppy's loved. But they're not going to put the, pick the puppy up, put him on the table, said, here, eat the bread. <laughs> now, that time is coming after Acts chapter 2. 
it begins. And then it begins in earnest a little later when um, I think we have Paul first, you know, he gets rejected by the Jews and he, he, he goes outside and he goes, I, I am done here. I'm going to go witness to the Gentiles. And that's where the ministry starts in earnest in witnessing to the Gentiles. The loaves start going to the Gentiles. But right now, if you're a Gentile and you have faith, you can get crumbs. In other words, you're not getting any less of the gospel. It's just not going out broadly to non-Jews. And that's what's being illustrated here. And he's doing that because he loves people, all people. Um, in the sense of that gift, that opportunity is there for all people, even now. So although it's not yet time for the loaves of the gospel bread to be fed to the Gentiles in mass, the time is indeed coming when the Gentiles will receive those loaves of gospel. It will be preached in the open air to the crowds of Gentiles and will go out throughout the whole world. That beginning of this mass proclamation among the Jews occupies most of the pages of the book of Acts. It occupies most of the pages of the epistles of Paul. But right now and for now... It happens only on occasion, symbolized by crumbs. Mark 7, 29. And he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. See, it's interesting here. He uses the word puppy. He says to her that, you know, the bread is just for the children. You know, we, and she says, yes, Lord. I am a puppy, Lord. But even the puppies can eat the crumbs that fall from the table. If I am able to receive this, Lord, why deny me? And it really, he, he marvels at that. I mean, he always marvels when non-Jews get what he is saying and Jews don't. Right? Because we just got off speaking about Pharisees and scribes. So it's fantastic news. You may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. What opened the door for this wonderful result? Matthew 15, 28 tells us. Same story, different gospel. Then Jesus answered her, O oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. So you see the connection between heart and faith. This whole chapter, has, he's been speaking about heart. He never even mentions faith. Now he gets to the Syrophoenician woman and the connection is made. It's been drawn out. A heart to believe who he is and what he can do. Because remember, in the Gospel of Mark, that's the, that's the main thing that's happening here. He's declaring through the miracles who he is and what he's able to do. Right? She gets it. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Gone. Jesus was impressed by her faith. Her words were an expression of her heart. One which is presenting words of a Gentile woman's faith in the Jewish Messiah. Every single person sitting here today did that. You expressed your Gentiles who express faith in the Jewish Messiah. Now, he's the Messiah of the whole world, but he was a Jew. He was the Jewish Messiah. Can't get around that. <clears throat> a heart that says, I may not be Jewish, but I believe you will do for me and my daughter what you were doing for Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. And for the words she spoke, for the sake of her heart, Jesus moved, delivering her daughter even from a distance. For what is distance to the Lord God Almighty? Amen? She did not receive a gradual healing. Distance did not cause the healing to be partial or slower. He delivered her, poof, just like that. Mark 7, 31. <clears throat> Actually, before I go there. A 
I think of, you know, all healings, all deliverances um, in really both the Old and New Testament speak of salvation. They speak of, um, of being purged of that which is unclean and receiving that which is holy. And I think back to the day of my salvation, and I want you to think back to the day of your salvation. Always remember the day of your salvation. Always remember when, you, when, when that faith that you changed, that you had, changed and became something alive. It, it stopped being just a reading of the book and became something that was like alive. It's the, it's the difference between, you know, me meeting Nancy and me falling in love with Nancy. You know? I know Nancy, but then I fall in love with Nancy. It, it becomes a heart thing, you know? And um, in spite of the fact that I'm still a sinner, that I still make mistakes, I still have my flaws, I still have my character issues, they're getting better, amen? But they're still there. My salvation, poof, in an instant. And the beauty of it is, and the reason... It could be like that is because in that instant, I did not become perfect in my own self, but it's like this, I mean, it's kind of, it's like this robe floated down and went, whew. and like a jersey has your name on the back. Mine would say righteousness of Christ, perfection of Christ. You're still you, you're flawed you, but you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are made whole and your spirit indeed on that day of your salvation was seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, now Mark 7:31. So that's over. And now we see that he, Jesus and troop returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. So the first thing you want to know is that if this is Israel, this is the Sea of Galilee. It's basically a, in northern Israel, but just above middle of Israel. And Tyre and Sidon are above Israel, just over the border. And they're on the coast. So they went from here to here. And then went like this to the Sea of Galilee, walked around it or went across, we don't know, and ended up down here on the Sea of Galilee in another pagan area called the Decapolis. The, the word deca means 10, polis means cities, the 10 pagan cities of Grecian culture. Okay? Not Jewish. But this is the area where a former resident of a cemetery who was loony... Right? I don't know if you remember, they got off the boat. This guy came rushing at them. His clothes were all in tatters. He had chains around that were broken. I mean, if you saw that coming towards you, you see your life flash before your eyes. And Jesus just delivers him. And he, and he, he becomes the first, really, one of the first pagan evangelists. So when Jesus arrives in the Decapolis, I mean, time has gone by. So his fame has spread even down to there. But they had an evangelist preaching the gospel. So he was known in this area is what I'm trying to say. So when he showed up, crowds came. And this was the second time there. I want you to, you know, also. So verse thir uh, slide 13, Mark 7:32. So he, he gets there and they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. So the Gentiles now bring a man who is deaf and has a speech impediment to Jesus. It's not that he can't speak. But anyone who um, knows a deaf person knows that they don't have a proper reference for what speech should sound like. And because they can't hear others or themselves, their speech is, um, it's, it's not the same as people who can hear and speak. It's, it's um, hindered. 
and it forms differently. So it wasn't that he couldn't speak, but his speak was, um, his speech was, it was an impediment. That's a good word for it. I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. So they wanted him healed, right? Now, I don't know if they wanted him healed just for a show or if they, if, if they cared about this man. You know, I bet you there were both types of people there. People who were close to him certainly wanted him healed, didn't they? But Jesus, for some reason, takes him aside from the crowd privately. He does not do this as a public healing. He removes this man from the crowd. So I do believe there were there, there were those there who, who, you know, like the verse goes, we played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We played music and you didn't sing. And Jesus wasn't going to be a part of that. What he's going to do, he's going to do for this man. And he removes them from the people who are just interested in spectacle. Okay? So the circumstances of this healing have been a great cause of wonder and even confusion for many a believer. How do you explain why he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting touched his tongue? That's kind of gross, isn't it? Why would Jesus have to stick his fingers into this guy's ears? Why spit and then touch this man's tongue? The commentators offered various uh, reasons for why Jesus did these things. And here's an example of one of the most accepted reasonings. And it's by a man named Adam Clark. And he says two things. One, Jesus put his fingers in his ears to show the deaf man that his ears could be opened only by the finger, in effect, by the power of God, and that they should be shut to every word and voice but what came from Jesus. Well, that sounds very noble, doesn't it? I barely understand what he's even saying. But anyway, next point. Spitting out, he touched the man's tongue to show the deaf man that his mental taste and his relish should be entirely changed, that he should hate those things which he had before loved and love those things which he before hated. That's pretty deep. I could see myself trying to come up with like a reason like this, right? It sounds very intellectual, very knowledgeable. What if I'm making this way too complicated? The structure of the sentence, I'm going to show you this in a second, actually tells us a different story, a drastically different story. Again, this is where we would do well to slow down and note the sentence structure for its immediate context. Slide 15. I'm going to read this verse to you again. Slide that You had it up. You had the right. Next. Thank you. And taking him. Who's him? Well, Jesus is taking the man aside. So Jesus took the deaf man aside. He, Jesus, put his, Jesus' fingers into his Jesus's ears. Jesus put his fingers in his own ears. You see, if you wanted to change the context of the sentence, you'd have to change the structure. And Jesus put his fingers into the deaf man's ears. It's following a context of it's about Jesus, about Jesus, about Jesus. And if you want to change it, you have to make it about the deaf man. They don't do that here. He says his, the exact same words he uses twice before in different form. Jesus put Jesus' fingers into Jesus' ears is the proper context. Now, this is going to make very, uh, a lot of sense to you. After spitting, and after spitting touched his, Jesus' own tongue. Now, I ask you, if you were about to do a miracle on this man over here, well, no, because he's blind. On, on a man who's um, deaf and has a speech impediment, but he can see. How are you going to communicate to this man what you're about to do? That's the response you're going to get. Absolutely. Go ahead. He's using sign language. Now, he's not speaking American Sign Language, but he's doing what he can do to explain to this man, because he took him away privately, and he's showing him what he's about to do. <laughs> Nobody does. A few people do. There were two commentators that agreed. 
but it make, I'm an investigator. That's what I did for a living. And this makes total, obvious, logical sense. It takes away the mystery because the Bible, reading the New Testament, reading the Bible should not be rocket science. Now look, granted, if you read Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, or Revelation, you're going to need to buckle down and be ready to be a student of the word. All right? But, but generally, especially in things of salvation, the Bible is quite clear. He spoke to the man in the only language he would understand, sign language. He then spoke as he so often does, and the miracle happens. I think I missed something. I just want to go back up. Okay, no, it's the next verse. It's uh, verse 34. I got to go back down to where I was. Just bear with me. Pretty deep, kind of difficult to understand. Taking him aside. Okay, verse 34. I just wasted a lot of time. But that's okay. Uh, verse 34 and 35. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him that hard word. Ephaphatha. That is, be opened. It's even a hard word to say. Right? Um, so he didn't have to do all these things to this man's face to make it happen. He, he communicated to the man, right? I could just see him. Communicated to the man. He doesn't want him to do, oh, yes, definitely I want that. And maybe he went like this or maybe he didn't. I, I think he did. But anyway, and he went, <sighs> he opened. And that's it. He didn't have to yell. Nancy and I were watching a video yesterday out at a church that tried to heal a dead child. And what they spend, like two weeks, something like that? Oh, it's a very popular church. I'm going to be kind and not name them. And they're trying, they have a corpse on the stage and they're trying to yell. I mean, it's just yelling and freaking out. And P.S., after two weeks, the body was decomposing. They had to take the body away and bury it. When the Son of Man speaks... Do you think when God created the universe, he had to like yell? No, he went, be formed. <laughs> Immediate. No process. Now, he took six days to make all of creation. But when he spoke it, it happened. Poof. The deliverance happens. The healing happens. Fully. Verse 36 and 37, and Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. Isn't that the way it always is? When you get something good happens to you, you want to talk about it. And I don't care if the person says, I'd prefer you not. You're going to be like, listen, you're going to go to your friends first and you're going to go, now don't say anything, but you wouldn't believe what happened, Right? Why is he, I've said this before, I'm just going to say it again for the sake of driving it home. Why would he tell them not to say anything? Why does he always tell everybody, don't say anything? It's not his time yet, exactly. When, it's, when he knows the time is coming, he's going to stop saying that. What time? The time he gets arrested and crucified. But it's not time yet. He's not like trying to, you know... That's why. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So, on the one hand, while he's telling everybody not to say anything, the time is coming after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. That new instruction is boldly and clearly given. Go. Preach the gospel to all nations. Shout it from the rooftops. Do not keep it within yourself. Let everybody know what the Lord has done for you. Amen? Jesus has indeed done all things well, perfectly, without flaw, delivering the world, Jew and Gentile alike, Amen. 
the gospel of grace. For the demon possessed, bound in chains of sin, depraved ways of thinking, depraved ways of acting out, delivered from the clutches of the enemy into the arms of Christ and the Father under whose wings we are sheltered. For the blind, those who cannot see either one's own sin as a vehicle of either their damnation or the grace by which they can be saved, they can't see either. Unable to see the Satan they serve, nor the Christ whom delivers. The deaf, unable to hear or understand the words of the gospel, the words of life that will rescue you from your sin now. Power to overcome and hell itself in your future. The mute. Opening mouths once bound shut, unable to speak out in faith or to speak to others in bondage. The words of life, the gospel, now loosed, able to proclaim, I am his. And deliver to others the good news that saves. All of that accomplished by one man the God-man, Jesus Christ, who came to earth and lived a sinless life because you can't, because you've told lies and you've stolen and you've cheated and you've coveted things that don't belong to you. You've dishonored your parents. You didn't serve God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You rejected him. You, you, You used his name as a cuss word. You stamped on the very message and the messenger who would deliver the words of life for however long you did. And he lived that perfect life just so that he could bear the wrath of God on a cross after being tortured, the cup being poured out on him of God's wrath on the the whipping pole, just drizzled out. And then when he got onto the cross, the whole cup poured out over him. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? It is finished. In case you didn't realize, that's when all the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. He did not go to hell and suffer under the hands of the demons or Satan. The victory was won on the cross. Now, I do believe he did go to hell, but I don't believe he went as a victim. Amen? And then he rose again. And then he rose again. Right? He came back to life, then he ascended. Because, you know, do I really want to come back to life in this world? (laughs) No, I want to go and be with the Lord where he is. And it will eventually be in on earth. It just won't be this earth. It'll be a renewed earth where heaven and earth are one and the same. And he did all that, as I said, to deliver the demon possessed, those under the bondages of sin. To deliver the blind those who cannot see, to deliver the deaf, those who can't speak faith so that you can be delivered from sin, so that you can see and so that you can and want to speak this wonderful gospel of grace. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Father God, I praise your holy name and I thank you, Lord, for the truths that you've taught today, Lord God. I thank you that you um, would use a vessel like me, Lord, flawed as I am. I pray, Lord, that um, my brothers and sisters and I would all be drawn closer to you, Lord, that that we would leave here today loving you, Lord, and and just tears crying from our eyes, Lord, how good, good, good you've been to us, Lord. And that in all things that I may accomplish in my life, Lord, I know that it's you who accomplished them. It's you who is my strength, my wisdom, my heart, my mind, my spirit, Lord. And I forever glory in you and give you the glory, Jesus.